Now, over the past several years, some of our colleagues, our colleagues in Mount Sinai in New York City, have advocated the use of antibiotics and broad spectrum antibiotics for the care of IBD patients. Now, we would definitely have had some success with some of our patients, perhaps the Crohn's colitis patients, being put on quinolone antibiotics, ciprofloxacin for long-term care. That pretty much was a guarantee for all those individuals to go on and contract C. diff. The other issue that we have found is that um, our patients who have undergone an ileoanal pouch reconstruction, the UC patients who have undergone J pouch reconstruction, will oftentimes need to be on antibiotics as a way to control pouchitis. That is a very, very high risk setting for the contraction of C. diff. And our colleague Bo Shen at the Cleveland Clinic has actually seen approximately 19% of his chronic pouch patients have gone on to have problems with C. diff. So we presented this paper in combination with Christian Stone's paper from the Washington University in St. Louis. And these were back to back publications in clinical gastroenterology and hepatology. And I think I was the victim of no one wanting to shake my hand for a few months after that because they immediately assumed that this was an institution-specific phenomenon. And uh, what we tried to do is show that this was perhaps not something limited to only tertiary referral centers. And my uh, colleague, Ashwin Anantha Christian, who's an incredibly talented young man who's an epidemiologist as well as a gastroenterology trainee, actually used the nationwide inpatient sample to determine whether this phenomenon was occurring in the United States. So for those of you who are not familiar with the nationwide inpatient sample, this is basically a um, project that has been um, funded by the National uh, Healthcare Quality Initiative as part of the NIH. Um, it has discharged summaries from 1,000 short-stay hospitals in the United States. And there's roughly approximately 6,000 short-stay hospitals in the U.S. So you have approximately one out of every five hospitals that are pooling their data on discharge summaries. And you can query this. And this is a very good way to sort of confirm trends that might be occurring at a national level. So sure enough, when we looked at this, we saw that there was, again, the doubling of C. difficile during this time period from 98 on to 2004. There was a significant rise in the patients with Crohn's disease and UC who were contracting C. diff as it was coded on their discharge summaries. But what we found most striking was the fact that the IBD patients who had C. difficile had a significantly increased mortality. So approximately 4% of the patients with IBD admitted to a hospital in the year 2004 who contracted C. difficile died. Um, and if we actually start to do the math, there were 118 confirmed C. difficile deaths amongst the IBD population in 2004. And if we just multiply this up to get an estimate of the events that are occurring in the United States, we estimated that approximately 500 patients, and this is a low estimate, died as a result of C. difficile infection in the U.S. Now, I think it's important for us to sort of step back. We are overly perhaps preoccupied with certain issues in the inflammatory bowel disease world. We're very concerned about complications of immunosuppressive therapy. There has been a huge initiative on our colleagues in pediatrics to be very careful when it comes to use of combination anti-inflammatory agents, combinations of anti-TNF agents with immunosuppressants because of the potential for very severe neoplastic complications, things like lymphoma. So, Correct me if I'm wrong, I think we've had less than 30 hepatosplenic T cell lymphomas confirmed over the past decade plus in the IBD world. We're having about 500 C. difficile associated deaths annually since 2004. So if we do the math, we've got about 2,500 patients who have died as a result of this infection. Now the problem is, is that you're not going to find it unless you look for it. And if you're dealing with an infection that mimics an IBD flare where we're using broad spectrum agents to basically blunt immunity, you're, you're really setting your patients up for trouble. And I think the biggest offender here is going to be intravenous steroids. The way the body clears the C. difficile infection is by making a humoral immune response to the toxin A, an IgG immune response to toxin A, and some of our most effective drugs in the world for shutting down humoral immune responses are steroids. So the knee-jerk reaction to admit a patient, place them on high-dose IV steroids, I think is what has unfortunately precipitated this a very, very unfortunate reality. So this is a quick review of the IBD experience with C. difficile. Um, patients with colitis are definitely the group that are at increased risk. Um, we actually did a multivariate logistic regression to show that maintenance immunosuppression was one of the uh, issues that correlated with uh, individuals who went on to get this infection. So basically azathioprine, 6-MP, and methotrexate. Interestingly, anti-TNFs did not appear to correlate with the C. difficile emergence. Um, this is something you have to maintain a high index of suspicion because 10% of the cases that we saw in 2005 were new presentations. They can actually occur concurrently. 
Patients never heard of inflammatory bowel disease, and they're coming with C. diff and IBD at the same time. Um, the majorities are going to be diagnosed as outpatients. I believe our number was 78% of the individuals were diagnosed within um, 48 hours of admission, which we interpreted to mean that this was an uh, acquired infection from the outpatient setting. Um, it can definitely be a contributing factor in patients who've been in stable remission for years and suddenly break through and become ill. I definitely would recommend looking aggressively for C. diff in that setting. Now, making the uh, diagnosis is problematic, and I'll show you in a few slides from now that multiple stool samples for the toxin ABLIs are really required to feel confident in terms of a patient not having the infection. And then the last bullet point here is if you have a patient in the outpatient setting who's not responding to metronidazole, consider the conversion to vancomycin. If you have someone who's in the inpatient, I'd probably start with vancomycin, and there's going to be good data we can extrapolate from a nice uh, randomized trial that was performed in Canada that shows clear superiority for vancomycin in patients who are sick enough to require hospitalization. So diagnostic considerations for C. difficile in the IBD population. Um, unfortunately, it's nonspecific. We don't have easy clues sometimes that'll tell us about this. I think when we're waiting for leukocytosis to occur, it's probably too late. You know, when you see a white count of 30,000, we're going to be in deep trouble. Likewise, in the albumin's falling. These were all markers of someone going to, uh, heading down a very, very ominous path. Radiographic studies are also nonspecific until things are fairly far gone. And endoscopic appearance, um, as I mentioned previously, pseudomembranes are not going to be uh, present in the majority of IBD patients, and only about 50% of the general population will demonstrate pseudomembranes. Um, the diagnosis is typically made in laboratories that are the gold standard assay is going to be a cell culture toxin assay, but this really requires a level of expertise in the microbiology uh, laboratories to be able to grow this. It, it's labor intensive. It's more expensive. Some hospitals have made the decision to go this route. This is what we're doing at the University of Pittsburgh. We've abandoned the toxin AB ELISA assays because of the lack of sensitivity, but it's going to be a much more, uh, perhaps more rare uh, diagnostic approach. Um, the toxin screens are uh, very effective when they're positive. The problem is, is that the sensitivity is really not as good as we would like. And it's very easy to, be, very easy to do this, and it's less expensive, but keep in mind that the, the rate of detection is not what we would hope. So this was our um, data from the 2005 cohort, and what we're looking at here is the, the first, second, third, and fourth toxin ELISA assay. Now, John Bartlett has from Johns Hopkins has recommended that a minimum of three toxin AB ELISAs be sent to have approximately a 90% uh, confidence that you're going to be able to make the correct diagnosis. So there's about a 10% false negative rate in the general population. What we found, unfortunately, that it took four samples to have a false negative rate of 10% in the IBD cohort. Now, in the inflammatory bowel disease population, I think we do have to remember that there are special scenarios to keep in mind. I already touched on the problem with J-pouch reconstruction, the ileal pouch reconstruction patients who are typically treated with antibiotics as one of their major forms of therapy, and ciprofloxacin and other broad-spectrum antibiotics are oftentimes the uh, mainstay of people who are suffering from chronic pouchitis. So approximately one in five patients with chronic pouchitis may be demonstrating C. difficile if we can extrapolate from Bo Shen's experience. The other thing I would comment on is that in patients who've had uh, diverted segments of bowel, uh, people who've undergone a, a colectomy and have a Hartman's pouch left in place, there is a report that C. difficile will colonize the Hartman's pouch and actually can have a growth advantage in that environment. So food coming through the GI tract actually functions as a prebiotic. It's actually the substrate that allows bacterial populations to grow. And when the lower segments of the colon are diverted, that can create an, an environment where anaerobes can sometimes have a preferential advantage in terms of growth. And when this occurs, it's really important to use some form of topical therapy, which typically means a vancomycin enema. And we do not have uh, metronidazole suppositories available in the United States. That's something that's available in Europe only at this point. Actually, along that same lines, it's important for people to know that when you give metronidazole for the treatment of C. difficile, it actually has to be absorbed and it comes through the bile. And that's how it actually gets into the lower GI tract. So um, in a patient who has a, um, someone who might have gone through surgical um, interruption of their GI tract, it, you're not going to be able to get antibiotic into that diverted segment of bowel through the intravenous administration of drug because it's going to be basically excreted through the liver to ultimately get into the lumen. So you have to use a topical approach in that setting.